Hi, welcome. This is Designing a Design Challenge with the Tech Interactive. We're going to be starting momentarily. Um, while you get settled, um, we have a couple resources that we will be using during this session. We sent them out via email, but we'll also put them link for them in the chat here. Um, you can download them to refer to throughout the session. Um, once again, this is Designing a Design Challenge. Um, and we have a couple resources that we um, are sharing now in the chat that you can check out. Um, we'll be referring to them throughout. Um, we'll get well, started in a few minutes. Yeah, we're gonna get started in a few minutes. Um, while we get um, started and everybody comes in, um, you can go ahead and let us know what your experience with design challenges is. Um, this is a Poll Everywhere survey. Um, for those who haven't used one of these before, um, you can use your tech you can text on your phone or you can email um, to this pollev.com uh, at backslash Amy Booker, that's me, 783. Um, or you can text 22333 and then text Amy Booker 783 and then text your response. So let us know if you have no experience with design challenges, that's great. We just wanted to know. And if you do them all the time and you feel you are an expert, let us know that as well. So we're going to give more people a chance to come in in about the next minute or two, and then we'll get started with all of the content. Welcome to those of you who have joined us already. We had a couple people who are just getting started with design challenges. That's great. And once again, we put in the um, the chat link. Uh, link for the some of the resources we'll be using during this session about designing a design challenge. So you can um, click on those and check them out um, uh, throughout the session. We have some people who've done design challenges a number of times and some with no experience. So that's wonderful. We have a nice range. Um, again, if you're just joining, you can text um, or um, email your response to the link and we put that in the chat for you as well. Looks like we're evenly divided right now between folks who have no experience and folks who have tried it several times. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so once again, um, there's a link to the resources that we'll be going over, but we'll go over them again in a little bit. This session is called Designing a Design Challenge. Um, it's with the Tech Interactive um, and Bowers Institute. My name is Amy Booker. I'm a professional development specialist with Bowers, and I'm new to the Tech and Bowers, but I've been designing design challenges and using them for over 15 years, both in an informal setting, um, like after school programs, as well as publishing curriculum with them. So I'm excited to share some tips and resources with you all today. And I'm Erica Barueto. I'm the Senior Director of the Bowers Institute at the Tech Interactive. Um, and the Bowers Institute is the branch of the tech that's focused on turning all of our great programs like the Tech Challenge and our exhibits um, and other resources from, our, um, from the Tech Interactive into resources for educators and students. Um, so uh, really pleased to have you all here with us today. We're recording this session. So I just wanted to let you all know that um, we're recording the session so we can share it out with all of you afterwards, as well as other educators that may have missed it and find it valuable. Um, our session goals are really to get you all inspired to design your own design challenges, to explore the steps that we have um, to take you through that process, and to allow you to work along um, and begin that process. We're going to go at a pretty fast clip today um, to get through all of it and give you an overview over the next hour. Um, but we really wanted to encourage you to um, do a little bit today, get that seed started, um, and then at the end, um, we'll allow you some time to share if you'd like and give feedback. And there'll also be another follow-up session where we can do that as well. So um, again, we really appreciate your time and are excited to have you here today. Um, we're going to start with an overview of design challenge learning, just a quick synopsis of that. Um, and then we're going to go through the process of designing a design challenge. So we're going to introduce the tools, which are again, they're in, in the chat. You can go to a Google folder that has an overview tech tip 
and a template that you can um, you can use to fill out um, to guide you through the process as we go through things. We're going to share some examples of uh, design challenges at those different phases and steps and give you some time to work on your own ideas and share those out at the end. Okay, so to get started, um, does, what is design challenge learning and what are design challenges? So um, design challenges use real world problems to engage learners in an iterative design process. So um, many of you are probably familiar with um, different examples of the design process or the engineering um, design process. For us at the tech, we've um, developed this graphic you can see here uh, outlining some of the steps that apply to both of those. So in the middle, you'll see imagine, create, test, and reflect. And those are the steps of the process that learners might enter at any point um, and, and go through maybe simultaneously or even at different times. And then on the outside are the more metacognitive pieces of defining your problem and sharing solutions that again might be iterated and repeated throughout the process. And on the outside of that, we have these innovator mindsets that we've defined as characteristics that um, innovators are using throughout the process as well. So why are we doing design challenge learning? What's the value of it? Many of you may have an answer for this already. You can put them in the chat if you have ideas yourself of why you've done or tried design challenge learning. Um, please feel free to share with us and with each other. Um, some of the reasons we have found in the past are that it develops independent thinkers. It empowers learners and it guides them to really be creators and problem solvers and really fosters those four C's, collaboration, critical thinking, um, and um, creativity, things like that. At the Tech Interactive, we've defined four elements that we see as kit critical um, to design challenges. So when you're working on this process of designing a design challenge, you're gonna come back to whether your challenge meets these four criteria or elements. So it should be solvable by multiple solutions. There shouldn't be one answer for the problem that your students are looking at. It should involve op opportunities for iteration throughout so that students can test and improve their designs, whether that's a physical one or just a system solution. And it should really be connected to their interests and their prior experiences. So in addition to connecting to content knowledge and standards goals, it needs to connect to your learners and really resonate with them. And it should also be um, an explicit connection to real world problems or careers. So it really feels relevant to them um, beyond just the challenge and the moment that they're doing it in the classroom. Um, so in the tech tip that we mentioned in the link before, as well as in the template, you'll see we've created five steps for how to design a design challenge. And we're gonna kind of go through them, like Erica said, somewhat quickly during the session. Um, but um, we hope that we'll provide you with some resources to really get you started thinking. So the first step will be to develop the problem. Uh, then you'll look at criteria, constraints, and testing methods. Um, and once you've sort of created a design challenge, you're gonna test it and then create lesson flow and preparation that goes with it and then do it with your students. So um, we'll get started sort of outlining all of those steps. If you have any questions throughout this webinar, please feel free to use the chat feature or the Q&A button at the top of the screen to ask us questions throughout. We will try to respond as we get to them, um, but we'll also have a Q&A session at the end. So the first step is really developing your design problem. And what we encourage um, as part of this process is to really reflect on two aspects, your learners and your setting. So what are the goals for your learners? Um, what are things that you wanna have them, areas you might wanna have them grow and develop? Um, where are areas that they need support? And similarly with your setting, what's possible? What are the opportunities? And what are some of the constraints with your setting? We find that as we're developing design problems and working with educators in our programs, that there's sort of three areas that people wrestle with and different places they might start. So one is a standard. So you might have a standard or a learning goal that you're really trying to address and achieve. There might be a real world problem that you're 
you're wanting to connect with, let's say plastics in the ocean, um, or having students like, let's say, cyberbullying sort of as a real world problem. Um, and then a design product. So is there something that you actually want them to create, like an app or um, a functional, like a mechanism or something with a sensor? Um, so if you sort of brainstorm in those three arenas, what are those standards and learning goals? What are those real world problems? What are those design products? This is a nice way to get yourself started and have sort of a way to triangulate um, what your focus is. And then from there to really develop a design problem statement. So if we look at an example of this, we have a design challenge we use a lot called Solve the Fall. Um, this is sort of a version of what you might classically call an egg drop challenge, but it allows for more iteration and, and development. So in this challenge, our standards and learning goals are forces and gravity. Um, this isn't directly tied to it, but it might be a, a real world problem that we're really interested in exploring Mars exploration. Um, so we've got that idea, we've got the forces and gravity, and then we have uh, this idea of developing a design product that will be a device to reduce forces. So when we put those things together, our design problem statement ends up being build a device that will keep a payload safe when dropped. And when we present that to students, we might present it in the narrative of, you are scientists who are trying to launch a rover to Mars and you wanna really make sure that when it lands on Mars, it lands safely and doesn't break. So how can you build a device that will keep that payload of that rover safe when it's dropped on Mars, for example? And by the way, for those of you who are really into Mars exploration, we have a teen webinar coming up on Thursday, which we'll tell you about in at the end of this session um, that you're welcome to attend as well if you're interested with Lockheed Martin. And um, it's about uh, the development of Mars exploration. So, so now let's look about uh, at design problems and it's your chance to sort of brainstorm as well. So what ideas do you have for design problems? Um, again, you can use that pull everywhere link. Um, if it helps you, you can use those standards, real world connection, design product framing of it, or you could just suggest some ideas that you have um, or ideas that you've done before that you've really enjoyed or are working on tweaking. So again, we wanted to provide, a, there'll be a few opportunities throughout this session for you to think, um, jot down ideas on a paper that you've got on the template that we sent out earlier and shared a link with. Um, you all in chat, um, or just to throw it in, um, Poll Everywhere is a nice way for other folks to see your ideas. Ocean cleanup devices with small models, that's great. Any other ideas? Nice. Air travel safer during a pandem pandemic. Addressing racism. vaccine distribution. Are there any sort of key standards people? Insulated containers is a nice one. Sort of as a design product and then thinking about how you might work with different aspects and standards to pull into that. Mask design. Mm -hmm. So with a lot of these I, I see um, sort of a couple of strands coming out with things you might build physically, but then also things that might be related to systems. Solar ovens is a fun one. It's a great way to design a lot of data to collect. Sustainable devices for cleaning water or transporting water. Those are also great ones. Yeah, so as we saw with your examples, there was some that really lent themselves to having a physical product. Um, and we, we like to think of our design challenges in sort of two different types. One of engineering design challenges where the learners are really creating and testing a physical device, like in this solve the fall example that we just shared. Um, and then systems design challenge where they might be really uh, tackling a multifaceted problem and creating a multifaceted solution um, like that might have a process, a communication plan, logistics, and may also have a device involved. So like safer air travel, right, might involve both logistical aspects as well as a de devices that might help. Racism was another one somebody mentioned that would be a systems design problem that might have multiple types of solutions depending on the situation. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
And so with those two different kinds of design challenges, as you're thinking of what ideas are occurring to you, you can put them in sort of one camp or the other. And the reason why it might be nice to sort of figure out whether you want to focus on a physical build or focus on a system that also might have a physical build component um, is it because it affects the criterion constraints and sometimes the testing considerations as well as how students are sharing and what additional resources you might need to provide. So with a system design challenge, there's often a lot more research of figuring out what's going on, who will this affect, um, working with users um, a lot more and um, different stakeholders. And so thinking about those aspects. So if you have the seed of an idea now, one of the things you might have thrown up in chat or something that somebody else did in the poll everywhere, you can start um, sort of thinking about, is it engineering or systems? And then that moves naturally into the criterion constraints. So once you have that seed of an idea of, I think my design problem is going to be something like this, um, something around, let's say, safe air travel um, from your example, then you're going to think about the criteria and constraints. Um, and I honestly have to look at this almost every time to remember which is which. But um, the quick way to remember it is that criteria really determine the success of a solution. Right, so it has to remain standing for five seconds, has to meet the needs of a user, it has to withstand these earthquakes. Um, and the constraints are limitations. So maybe um, a time limit on build, a budget for what you're creating, and potentially something like device size, or um, you know how long you're executing on your solution in a system solution um, kind of <coughs> development. So if you um, look at the example of Solve the Fall again, um, if you remember, this was build a device that keeps the payload safe when it's dropped. For this one, we might say the ball and the device have to stay together in one piece for our criteria. They have, the device has to stay intact. We don't want that rover breaking when it fall, drops to the ground. Um, and then it can't bounce or light up. So if we were using a light up bouncy ball as our uh, example of our payload, then we would say that it couldn't light up and that would tell us that it was successful. Our constraints might be that you have 10 minutes to build, that your ball has to be visible, and uh, we might also say that you can't use tape or glue um, because we often use that as a, a requirement in a lot of our challenges to encourage more iteration and uh, faster creativity. And I just wanted to mention about criterion constraints too, that they're a way to really um, adjusting the constraints can make it more challenging or easier for different ages or levels of experience and can also help to promote multiple solutions and iteration. Um, and you can also involve your learners in developing criteria and constraints. That's a really good exercise for them to do, to become involved in that challenge and to think about what, what does success look like? What are we looking for and how can we measure it? And yes, somebody noticed that this is one of our tech challenge um, previous uh, challenges that we've sort of adapted a version of it for the classroom and we've also got a version of it for home use as well. So now think for a minute about your own challenge. You can just use this as a moment to think and brainstorm on a piece of paper or just on your own. You can also throw your ideas into chat um, if you would like. What are some of the criteria and constraints you would use for the challenge idea that you had at the beginning or one that you're inspired by now? I know a lot of um, educators we work with find budgets really helpful um, as a way to manage materials and have students really think critically about what they're using and why. So those have been really helpful for people in the past. Materials, yeah, that, budgets can also encourage creativity. Mm -hmm. How can you use things differently? How can you modify materials? Um, someone has a question around how to alter design challenges for distance or remote learning, and we're going to touch on that um, a little bit later in the session. Um, but um, there's a lot of, of great ways to do things um, because it's design challenge learning is very much a project based learning. Um, and it's a way to to really extend things between remote and in person and asynchronous. Um, so there's a lot of nice components you can do in both of those settings, but materials often becomes a concern uh, when people are working at home. I love somebody's constraint is generally size because of storage in their classroom and what they're able to store between sessions. So testing methods. Um, 
after you have your design problem and you've considered your criteria and constraints, you really want to think about ways that students can test their design challenges um, because they're going to need to test and iterate. Um, you want to figure out ways for them to collect feedback and or data. So feedback from users, feedback from stakeholders or experts, um, and data about their, their solution measurements that they can take, um, anything related to the criteria. And then it's also a nice way to provide collaboration between teams where learners can really see what other teams have developed, see other teams' um, solutions and give feedback as well as pull, uh, pull great suggestions and what other folks have tried into their own designs. Um, and you also wanna provide ways to test early and often so that students are getting that feedback and able to iterate really quickly. This is also a good time in your process. Sorry, Amy, I have one yep, more thing to say around it, to check alignment with those four key elements of making sure that there's multiple solutions, iteration, and you're hitting participant interests and some real world connections. Um, so testing, uh, if you're thinking about engineering design challenges, right, there might be a physical rig that's involved, um, there might be safety concerns, you want to think about data, right, qualitative and quantitative, did it fly or not, how far did it fly, how are we measuring that and sharing and comparing data. And then with systems design challenges with those testing methods, you can really think about having surveys, um, focus groups or interviews, um, the students doing research is a way to get, for them to inform their design and get feedback. Um, presentations to each other, getting peer review or expert review, um, those are all great ways. And then using, you know, qualitative and quantitative ideas around surveys and rating scales and just what makes a cost-effective idea, for instance. And there are a variety of ways that you would share and get feedback on both of those. So they might include both informal things like peer sharing and gallery walks to formal presentations with audience members and there's a lot of great ways um, to be able to include even more people sometimes in this remote setting where you're bringing in special virtual guests that you might not have had before. Yeah, a lot of those special guests have more time in their travel schedule because they don't have travel schedules anymore. So there's more time for them to come in and, and uh, chat with your, your students. So in our example for Solve the Fall, um, we already went over what the criteria and constraints were for this. The testing um, rig could be anything from just an adult holding a device at a certain level every time and dropping it six feet to a more um, specialized mechanism like you see in this picture where you have uh, reliable testing because it's a latch device system that uh, students build and then release from. Um, you're setting up the testing station in a way that it's visible to everybody and you're having both formal times for them to share um, and also informal testing where they can test throughout as they're building. So once again, um, if you can think about your own challenge, the idea you have, like Letha has this idea of um, water pollution. If you have your own idea, how would you then think about testing that idea with your students? They've built this device, you've introduced some criteria and constraints, how are they going to test it? Um, where are they going to test it and how? And then also what kind of data and feedback are they going to collect? And do you need to build a test rig or can you use some simple um, tool or process? And this is often a point in the process where um, we find ourselves thinking like, oh, right, how far are we going into creating a model or creating something that may not be realistic anymore? Um, I was working with educators. One time we were trying to think of a design challenge where you might be able to test different habitats. And then it was like, okay, are we, we're gonna build stuff out of ice cubes and the ice cubes is, are gonna be like, or you know, the ice cubes would be like snow. All right, is this gonna work really well? What if we use something else? So here, in, when you're thinking about testing methods is often a way, a time for you to iterate and go back to your design problem um, and think more clearly about materials as well. So if you wanna think about your own testing methods, jot a few more ideas down, and then we're gonna move on to the next phase. And once again, we'll go over some ideas for distance learning and virtual setting in, um, in a little bit. Um, but I think we can, we can address that with the materials as we go through materials. So Amy, if you want to talk about these pieces, then we can talk about some of the, uh, what works at home. 
Mm -hmm. So um, with materials for um, when you're thinking about physical prototyping, you want to choose materials that promote iteration. That's the case with um, other types of materials as well, but you want things um, that are going to allow students to um, build and rebuild. So we often think of them uh, within categories like everyday and recycled items. You might have things that are new to your learners and that might include scientific or building tools that they haven't seen before, like a drill if you want to introduce that or some very specific makerspace tools like a scanner or something like that. Um, you might also be introducing whimsical objects that bring a little more fun to the, the process. So things like googly eyes or pom-poms that allow them to create some personality with their what they build. Um, we often suggest grouping materials by um, function. So thinking about it this way so it's a little more flexible if you don't have the exact materials. We do not recommend a kit approach or a set shopping list for materials. Um, allowing more flexibility allows more creativity with students. Um, so groups don't even need to have the same materials or you may have a buffet style setup where um, students are choosing the materials that will fit their um, process the best. So for Solve the Fall, for example, we divided this challenge into these categories. So we thought about what are the all-purpose items that might create the base for or the device that you're building. So that could be everything from cardboard to craft sticks. And um, what are the things that would help you connect? We weren't allowing them to use tape or glue necessarily in this one. So what are other ways to connect items together and what could serve that purpose? Um, what are some things that might work as cushioning material that students might want to use? Um, and then when we, if we did this for a home version and we send this to students, the encouragement is that they choose what they have available to them. So because there's not a set list, they don't need to require them to have the same thing across all students. Um, they can really choose what's available in their home space or their recycling bin or uh, their junk drawer and they're, and they're still able to meet the criteria and constraints and do the challenge. And this is where you might want to give them um, a heads up a couple weeks out that they can collect those materials. So, you know, in, in a couple of weeks, I can get a few twist ties from, you know, bread and some other you know, bagels and some other food items. Um, I've got a Cheerios box that I turned into a sale for one design challenge. Um, you know, a piece of string that you might normally throw away can be <laughs> essential for a design challenge. So, um, you know, carton of eggs. So I think it really helps the students to have these categories of materials and for you to start um, having them think about that. It also is nice even if you want to send home some kits of materials that you can be really flexible about what you give them, knowing that they're all gonna get different things and then come up with different and amazing solutions based on, um, again, some of the materials you'll be able to provide them from each category. And then often from there, they're able to look differently at the materials around their house. So, oh, I, you know, this might get thrown away, but let me see what I can do with that. I don't have any dowels, but we just got, um, you know, some, some takeout and I have chopsticks in my takeout food. Um, or I can roll up a piece of paper and turn that into a dowel. So there's a lot of options and flexibility with the materials. And um, because you're um, building all of these solutions with the idea that there's multiple solutions, there's not one right way to do it. If, if learners have a variety of different materials, um, they can still cr each create a, a unique and strong idea. It doesn't make their solution any lesser. If it's used um, just roll up dowels versus the other, it might have a more creative way of doing it. Yeah, um, we, go ahead, uh, Amy. No. No, I was just going to say we also created recently a material scavenger hunt activity. Um, so that might be something you want to use at the beginning of the year or before you do a challenge as like an intro to get started. Um, so if you look at systems design challenges, these are a little bit different in terms of they may include that physical aspect of prototyping, but they are going to also include more of these research resources. So readings, videos, perhaps experts that they're talking to or sample users. Um, it may also include um, more formalized uh, brainstorming or sharing or whiteboards. If anybody has resources they like to use for online brainstorming, I know we've used Padlet in the past or things like Google Tools, um, Google Classroom resources. 
um, feel free to throw those in the chat. I know people always appreciate knowing new um, technology tools for things like that. But so systems design challenges might involve the same like uh, physical prototyping at some stage, but they're also going to involve um, a lot more of these metacognitive tools. Um, so think for a minute about your own challenge and what materials you might need um, and um, what resources that you would be using. And while you're thinking on materials, I want to address something that came in through the questions of how to keep students motivated um, because they might quickly become frustrated. Um, and I think there's a couple ways um, that educators we know have dealt with this. And one is to really promote um, a culture of risk taking to um, celebrate failures, right? So like, oh great, your, you know, your vice, device didn't work. This didn't fall like a parachute. So how are you gonna change it? That's amazing. What did we learn from Erica's failed device or from this device that failed? Um, so you can really celebrate that as a way to learn, being pushing a little bit more on that being um, focusing on process over product. So if you're checking in along the way, that's one way that helps. I know that that doesn't always help me personally um, or some of the learners that I work with uh, because you really wanted that thing to work. So um, pushing on perseverance, on giving them time and flexibility. So maybe you can't finish it right now, but you have time this evening to work on it, or you have time tomorrow. Um, that's actually something we've found from um, the, our current learning and teaching situation that's helpful for some students, is they don't feel that time pressure necessarily, or they know they can come back to it later. Um, so we're gonna share now, see what we learned, and then we can iterate on it later. So I hope that's helpful. We also have um, a tech tip all about prototyping and different questions to ask there. So um, as promised, and we know that you all are dealing with a fluctuating um, landscape of how and where you'll be teaching and what's going on, but we all know that we're gonna be doing some amount of it virtual, we think, this year. So um, thinking about doing this in a virtual setting. Um, what are some of the things that have really come to mind for you as considerations that you found a solution for or things that you're still struggling with um, and you, you feel like need to be considerations you're thinking about for design challenges moving forward into this school year? So go ahead and throw some ideas into Poll Everywhere and also jot things down for yourself. This is really meant to be helpful tool for you. We've talked a lot about materials. People have put in materials. So somebody says how to keep the same level of collaboration when doing it remotely. They're looking for solutions for that. Um, since we can't emphasize collaboration, working on peers, um, providing feedback in a virtual setting. Yeah. Um, one thing that we found, you know, is, is a way to do some amount of collaboration is, um, is having small group meetings if possible so that you can actually do a session with maybe 10 students and they're all watching each other build. So if you can have everybody's cameras on, that one way to collaborate is really to see what other folks are doing. And if you want to mute everybody, which we know can can be an issue, then you can mute all of the participants, but kind of narrate yourself. So you can, you can highlight, oh, let's look at what Amy's doing, and she's doing something really interesting. Amy, can you hold that up to the camera? Um, so that's one way to sort of share ideas and work on that kind of collaboration. Um, the other thing is having them upload evidence of what they've built um, or how a test worked. So a narrative description or a video or a photos. Um, and then, like you said, allow students to give some feedback around what they saw, what they noticed. Um, Amy also came up with a great suggestion for sort of a telephone game where somebody builds part of a, a device and then sends a photo or drawing to the next person and they sort of iterate on it from there. Um, talking about camera shy, I have a camera shy uh, <laughs> child. <laughs> so in her sessions at school, she's like, Nope, I'm just gonna sit here and not say anything. Um, so sometimes giving those students another outlet for giving feedback or presenting and sharing, like my daughter's perfectly happy to do a video um, and share out that way, um, much more so than actually sharing during a live session. Is there anything else that's come up, Amy? 
Um, we've also got reading. some bench. I know it's, I don't know why this is showing up so large. It does not usually do this. A little pin, finicky. So the, um, we've had some mention of using recyclable items um, and emphasizing that for the materials. Uh, we also talked about school supplies. I know some students from um, certain um, communities don't even have access to scissors sometimes. So thinking about ways you can get around those kind of limitations when you come across them, like ways to tear things or like Erica said, using paper in a variety of ways. Um, and it looks like we also had some suggestions about um, small group um, things like zo uh, Zoom breakout rooms and really using those kind of features and monitoring them. Yeah, and there's um, also the opportunity to have people collaborate within their household. So having them build with a sibling or with a parent um, and having that be a way for them to collaborate as well as a nice um, alternative or addition, um, honestly, to the process. So um, in virtual settings, again, thinking about what you can do asynchronously versus synchronously and being able to mix that up to really give, again, the Shire students a different opportunity um, to process and to share um, and being able to um, provide students more time to sort of digest and test and even iterate outside of the class time um, when you might be synchronously with them. So with that, then there's sort of offline resources that, that families and students might need. So um, having them use journals, um, having them have ways to share photos and videos, and then thinking about ways to connect with their family and community, um, whether that's again around a physical build or interviewing um, a family member as a, uh, a user of their device um, or their solution. Um, considering how students are gonna access printed materials, um, devices, and connectivity. So again, having those um, solutions that some of you already mentioned around maybe a starter kit of materials or giving them time to collect recycling materials ahead of time. Um, and you might need to tailor a previous uh, lesson that you've done, or um, again, build this into a new design challenge that you're designing. And then those opportunities for special resources, I think don't shy away from asking um, some friends and family members and other people you know, um, or someone even you don't know, uh, to be a guest speaker for your classroom, because again, it's easier often actually in our situation we're in now for them to zoom in um, and uh, to be part of a video call with, with your students um, and make those kind of career and real world connections for you. And for those of you who are looking for even more ideas, we have a, tech, uh, a tip sheet on our website. We'll show, share the link to the website later um, that goes into even more ideas for um, teaching design challenges in a virtual setting. And we've also got some webinars from previous sessions we've done throughout this um, shelter in place time, which um, provide some more depth on this if you'd like. I'm just through the link into chat so people can check that out. Yeah. Um, so now that we've all got maybe a little bit of an idea of a design challenge and we've got some criteria and constraints and we've got some testing methods, now it's time to actually test it ourselves. So you're gonna Ideally, you'd find some sample participants or other educators, maybe your own child to test on, or um, you know, you have a class, a coworkers classroom, or some other educators who are willing to be your beta testers for you. Um, at the very least, you should try to create your own solution to your problem. So you should try to build it yourself and see what you encounter as you do that. Um, you're going to want to check for a number of things as you do that. Um, you know, does it allow for a, a multiple solutions and iteration? Does it align to those four key elements? Um, does it generate some useful data um, for you? How does it align with your standards and goals? And how long did it take? Was it accessible? Like, did the materials you were using work? Do you need to switch them out for something that's a little easier to manipulate or something like that? Um, and if you have actual participants to test it on, you can check if they were engaged, if they had questions or concerns, you know, if you can get some feedback on your idea. Um, this is all going to let you anticipate issues that come up. It's going to let you target your learners when you um, do the challenge with them. And it's also going to help you develop some exemplars and resources. So if you built a sample design challenge, you're not going to want to necessarily use it as this is what you're going to build. Here's my example, because that isn't really the goal. Again, we want multiple solutions, but um, 
you might be able to use parts of the process to show them how you did it, or you might be able to build a couple examples to use it um, to sort of get, get their thoughts flowing if they get stuck. Um, you're also going to be using the design process yourself um, when you test. So um, this is going to let you iterate and revise and strengthen your design problem. So once you've tested, then you're going to put this together into an actual lesson. So you probably have your own tools for lesson planning um, and you will definitely use those. But we um, sort of outlined um, some of the steps and things that we would consider how, and how they align to our design process. So we usually introduce the challenge in a way that's going to make it relevant and engaging for students. So you might use a video or guiding questions or scenario that sort of speaks to the students in the real world situation. Um, you're going to define the problem and the constraints. And then while they're doing the challenge, you can have separate brainstorming time or you can have um, students brainstorm as part of the prototyping process where they're creating, testing and reflecting as they go. And you're going to want to make sure you set aside time within your lesson for students to formally share solutions, get feedback, and debrief all of this. And then of course, you're gonna have some sort of assessment as part of this formative and summative. Um, a lot of the formative assessment is gonna come during the sharing sessions, but you'll, you might also wanna build in some other tools and ideas. We have, um, our Tech Academies team has developed a sort of longer unit and a way of looking at this if you were gonna do a project over more than a 60 minute class period or even just 120 minutes. Um, if you were going to use multiple classes to um, explore your design challenge, you might interrupt this process in the middle after one round and introduce more content connections and sort of deepen those standards goals and then maybe reframe the challenge again with some new criteria and constraints based on what students learned and then do the challenge again and iterate again. Um, so that's one way of looking at it and how you might introduce content even more fully into the process. Um, so here is an example of how you might do this with the Solve the Fall lesson. Um, you can see we have a link for the lesson plan um, on the slides, which we're going to send out later. Um, but you can also find this on our educator website. Um, this lesson plan goes into introducing the problem, framing the challenge. There's a formal brainstorming time students then prototype and then share solutions. So that's sort of an example of how to structure that lesson. And we've already talked about sort of the materials aspect um, in great detail, but you're really looking for an environment with these design challenges that fosters inspiration, risk taking, as we mentioned, iteration, collaboration, and empathy. Um, and so between your design problem and the narrative and real world connection with that, the materials, you also want to think about sort of the space and facilitation. Um, obviously, in your lesson plan, you're planning out your facilitation. So thinking about ways to support um, growth with vocabulary and providing additional scaffolds, emphasizing process over product. Um, and things you might want to do with inside your space, so providing visuals um, and scene setting. And that can be, again, done in a physical classroom or virtually. So what are those visuals and other things you might hang in your background to sort of inspire students around, again, like say a Mars theme? So now that you've um, tested, you've created a lesson plan, you're going to actually do this lesson with your students. Um, and then because you're always iterating and improving, you're going to reflect on what you did, what worked, what was unexpected, what would you change. Um, maybe you'll ask yourself how you, your students can give you feedback and then how you can share with others. Um, all with the understanding that you are learning and iterating too, and you're going to be flexible with yourself. Um, and um, vary your strategies as you go. And we always want to remind you to share what you're doing with others. Um, share with us, share with your colleagues. Um, it's a great way to celebrate the things that you're doing, but also to get um, feedback as well. Um, so now that we've talked about sharing, <laughs> Do you have any ideas that you have thought about throughout this session that you'd like to share with the other participants here and get feedback on? 
So I'm going to encourage people to be bold. So even if you have just sort of the seed of an idea, what we're going to do is we're going to promote um, a couple people to be panelists here for our whole group um, and just hear from a few folks around their ideas. Um, so uh, what are you thinking about? Sort of what grade level do you work with? Um, that idea of what standards you're going to, you're, you're looking at. Um, and where you might be uh, looking to go with this, some challenges you're facing. So, um, Amy, do you mind skipping ahead to that slide that sort of has the what we want people to present yeah. on? Um, so, I think if you if focus on these areas of sort of the learning goals, um, real world problem design product, and your problem statement, and then so framing your idea that way, and then where are you sort of stuck, or what do you what do you want to address? Um, we are going to hold a session next Thursday um, for about a half an hour, although we could extend it if we have lots of participants, um, that if you want more time to work on your idea and share and draft it and get feedback, uh, we're going to do that session um, on July 23rd. Um, we'll throw that link into chat. But right now, we're going to have a few folks raise their hand um, and, again, promote um, a couple of you to panelists to share briefly what your idea is and where you're stuck and then we'll have folks chat in some responses of things that they um, help they might want to give you about your design challenge so again so you can don't use be that shy. little feature to raise your hand yeah. on zoom if you go into that you're interested if you go into participants you should be able to raise your hand there and if that's not working you can chat and it looks like margarita santos is raising her hand excellent Hi, um, thank you for, oh wait, <laughs> hi, thank you, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Margarita, go yeah. ahead, and if you want to turn on um, your video, you can, or you can just do audio, it's up to you. Um, okay, I will, I'm using my iPhone right now, so I don't, I can't find the button that says. <laughs> no problem, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, anyways, um, yeah, I thought about, I put it in the, in the text per portion, um, I thought of, um, actually, we, we do a lot of um, STEAM challenges in my classroom, and I think two or three years ago, um, I posted, uh, it's called um, Solving a, wor a World Problem, like, it's kind of like a pun, because it's like word, word problem, but it's a world problem, and one of the kids decided to work, to form her own team, and that was the height of the water the the shortage of clean water for flint michigan mm -hmm. and i think it was like a small idea from a 12 year old and she was able to um do some re research iteration and i helped i helped her do the research and uh, um fixing the troubleshooting and then um, doing the model and presenting it to the class and she was able to produce a working um a working device that um, cleans cleans water, and you know she brought like a madil, you know, like dirty water, a cup of dirty water, and um, she showed us how she sterilized it or you know like made it made it cleaner. So um, that would be something, and I was really inspired by it, and that would be something that I thought I could present to my class of you know 2020, this coming class. Um, using um, materials that they find at home. And as, a, as I mentioned in the text um, chat, it needs to be sustainable and producible to be able, you know, to send to, because she, you know, I also encouraged that student in the past to send the design to an environmental organization that is helping, that was helping Flint. And she did, and she got some responses back. So um, that would be one of the criteria to make it easy, yeah, sustainable and easy to reproduce. Yeah, so is there, mm -hmm. go ahead, go ahead, Margaret, if you're going to ask a, a question. So, I mean, there are a lot of loopholes. I mean, you know, I was able to like um, guide her along, but is there anything that you think the panel or the, the, the group can help? Um, me with like little minor details that I probably overlooked. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll go ahead and give folks a chance to throw some things into chat. Um, uh -huh. I think that what was really helpful, um, a great 
way is that it was topical, it's relevant, it's a way to help other people, um, which often mm -hmm. engages a lot of students. Um, and then again, having um, some real sort of examples to pull from, right? Like, what are you trying mm -hmm. to do? What, what, what grade level do you work with? Sixth grade. Yeah, so being able to pull in some of the science to explore some of the science concepts more, um, mm -hmm. but also, you know, it, it sort of encourages more reading and research. Um, it mm -hmm. encourages them to really test something out and try things mm -hmm. out. Um, mm -hmm. And then to have sort of that real world, um, somebody who can speak to this as a profession and what, what works. Uh -huh. That's um, true, yeah. So I think those were all, all really great aspects. Um, mm -hmm. I think you know, with water safety, you have to obviously, there's not necessarily a good way for the students to test whether the water is really safe and drinkable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, that's true. <laughs> um, but there, there are ways to sort of work on that filtration aspect um, and mm -hmm. seeing what works. So, yes, yes. Thank you, that's, Margarita. Let's, we'll check the you. chat and then I think we have uh, Aida. Thank you. Who's mm -hmm. also willing to share. Thank I you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. If anybody has other ideas for her, feel free to show them in the chat. It looks like we have another person, Ada um, Rivera, who might be have an idea as well. Oh well, I um I had uh we did a, a design challenge where the kids designed a recreational vehicle, an RV. So that was really fun. But what I'm finding is that the kids are used to doing um, physical prototypes, and it is really hard to do it within the video the virtual. Um, setup. So it takes more time to guide them to uh, build an actual model. Um, these are younger kids around eight years, eight, nine years old, and they in person is easier to guide them physically, right? But now that it's virtually virtual, it's hard uh, to show them tricks of how to, you know, work with the physical uh, objects themselves, how to put them together or, you know, that sort of thing. So any ideas on that, I appreciate it. The other thing is um, usually what I tried to do is like if you could have some photos and the parents can help uploading those photos so the kids can get some feedback. But the problem is the parents don't really um, <laughs> do it and the kids don't really know how to do it. And so the best I've done is like, you know, get to the camera and I could take a screenshot, but obviously the quality is not there, not enough to be able to give feedback. So those are the two main things that I'm, um, uh, and time is the other uh, problem that I had at the end of the year was uh, because now this process takes longer, the time, I'm running out of time to get the thing just done. So any yeah. feedback, I mean, any, yeah, we'll, we'll uh, start with some suggestions and other participants, feel free to chat in um, ideas as well. Um, I think that with the physical build portion, um, oftentimes maybe scaling it back of, of what you're expecting them to build. Um, you know, vehicles can have a lot of moving parts and a lot of things that they have to troubleshoot. So mm -hmm. being able to maybe do some design challenges that work on aspects of that, right? So ones that might have um, some moving parts and wheels, but other things that might just be something that's carrying, um, carrying them like carrying something, carrying a load um, and delivering things. So maybe the solve the fall challenge, like we have. Um, uh, but I, I think that that's, that's one aspect around the physical builds of simplifying it a little bit since you um, aren't there to help like punch a hole or, you know, um, or help them with some of the things that they're still wrestling with trying to do sort of spatially and physically as well. Um, yeah, like they could just build the wheel and axle, for example, with something mm -hmm. simple to start off. Yeah, so there might be more scaffolding you need to get with that or even just more experimentation time. Um, and then I think that some people have found that it's if they allow the students sort of get them started on something and then have them, they'll sort of extend that build time into the evening and weekends, but then it's yes. not always the same for everyone. Yes. Um, We've done that and it's not, it's not even definitely. Yeah. Um, and then I think with that idea of how you're providing feedback, um, that again, maybe doing fewer design challenges, but having, I don't know if there's a way to have the students meet in smaller groups so yes. that they can um, show and share their designs mm -hmm. um, and give each other feedback as well as you giving feedback might be an option and opportunity there. Um, yeah, we've done breakout rooms to be able to help with that with the time. Yeah. The yeah. chat uh, 
some people in the chat also had some suggestions about starting small with just a couple items and doing them virtually. We've done a number of virtual prototyping sessions that have gone well with, um, you know, everybody having their devices working on while they're there. Um, and there's also some mention about um, uh, some issues others had about similar situations. Yeah, and I, I think that one thing too is, um, if you noticed on our solve the fall example, we gave a really short build time. And it's okay for if you set expectations with students and participants that they, um, they are gonna build just really quickly around this idea, but they're not gonna finish. Um, and then they can really talk about sort of what they tried so far and what worked. So like, I put this together to make a sale, but I think it might be too floppy. Um, and so they can talk about aspects of their design, uh, maybe ha even just simple things of how they connected things together. Um, and that way it sort of takes away that pressure of I have to build this thing that works and then show it off to everybody. But I'm, we're all going to have five minutes to explore this idea and then we're going to share out um, what we did and what's working and what we tried, what materials we used to really sort of get that, um, get those ideas going and still be able to go through a prototyping process without necessarily having a finished product. Mm -hmm. So I think we're running low on time here. I hope that was helpful for you and for other people who are listening. Um, again, we're looking forward to um, potentially seeing you all um, on the 23rd. So. Um, I think we put this into chat and you guys can, um, we'll send it out as a follow-up as well. You can register for that session. So take the tools and things we ran through today and um, bring your design challenges to us uh, next week and also some of the other issues um, that you might be dealing with. And we have some guidance and solutions and um, things that we all have tried that we can share with each other during that session. And we have a number of resources. Erica already put this link for educator resources in there. We also have these parent guides we've created since the beginning of Shelter in Place that um, provide a number of tools of um, student facing and parent facing resources that you can send directly to parents uh, with instructions. And we have some Spanish resources as well on our um, tech.org and CASA. So we'll put those links in the chat for you as well. Um, and oftentimes getting those parents um, involved is a way to really, um, if they understand what the challenge is and how they can support the students and that can help move things forward as well. And um, I promised you information about a Mars um, session on the next, on this Thursday. So if you're interested, um, check out the tech.org backslash calendar. We have all of our team events listed there as well as our upcoming webinars um, and um, the session um, for teens on Mars it, and with Lockheed Martin is on the 16th at 3 p.m. Um, we want your feedback so those of you who are still here I'm also, we're also putting the bit.ly link in the um, chat for you um, to go um, give us some feedback that help us iterate and grow um, as presenters and um, in presenting you information that's useful to you. So please provide us with feedback on this session. We will be emailing out the um, slides as well as the recording to everyone um, and we'll try to add in that material scavenger hunt information as well. Um, if there's anything else you've heard us mention during this session that you would like us to make sure we include, um, let us know that as well. Yeah, so we're looking forward. We hope a number of you join us uh, next Thursday for a debrief. Hopefully you can do some work on the design challenges and get some feedback on ideas for this fall. We'll obviously lean into that virtual discussion during that session as well. Um, and it's just for, for those of you who joined us. So um, it will be a, a small group and we'll be able to have some good discussion. Um, please give us your feedback and thank you again so much for joining us today for taking the time um, to do this and um, for all that you do for your students. Um, thank you everyone. And thank you to Margarita and Ada for being brave enough to share your ideas and questions with everybody as well. <laughs> thank you. It wasn't a big deal. Thank you. Thank you.